So uh, welcome everybody. I know that we have some who are joining us live and others will be watching the videotape and a couple of the courses, but um, Dr. Mark Freeland um, is director, I think director and coordinator of the program of study, American Indian yeah. Studies. Um, and uh, Dr. Freeland and I really don't know each other, just uh, I guess internet stalking, but uh, he was uh, a Tink Tinker scholar at Isla Seminary um, mm -hmm. and that really stood out to me because of the work that ILIF is doing uh, and just the work that Tink Tinker has done with his whole life mm -hmm. and then looking up some of the things uh, with Dr. Freeland and I thought man this is a perfect person for us to have here today in this virtual world. Uh, we, we just apologize we couldn't uh, woo you with the beauties of Kentucky at this moment um, but you can take our word is very nice right now. Um, okay. <laughs> and, I look forward to the possibility of coming here at some point. I'll always be happy traveling in that part of, uh, we, I lived in Denver for 13 years and then in upstate New York, which is pretty hilly. There's not a lot of topography where we're at. It's very, very flat. So I'm yeah, always happy to look at some hills. We can give you a few of our version of mountains. So without further ado, we're going to turn the time over to you and, uh, and the, the space is yours. Uh, uh, thank you very much. Um, so, uh, uh, Majita, Majita, Makarakanga Danjuba, Dr. Freeland Um, so Makwanindo them bears my clan. Uh, I am from the Bahoting and Anishinaabe Nation, and it's now in northern Michigan. Um, some of the names I'm going to use, you're, you're not going to know. Um, however, some you already know some of my language. Um, so um, what we know as shoes in Anishinaab in, in Indian culture, like makasin, like makasin is my language. It's uh, makasin. So like it literally just means footwear, like any footwear. Um, but of course, it's been come to known to, to being uh, indigenous kind of ways of wearing shoes. And uh, even the, the term Michigan, uh, michigamai, um, literally means uh, the biggest body of water, the biggest sea that I have ever experienced. Uh, and that becomes the land of Michigan. And there's, uh, the land is drenched in indigenous names. And I always like to point that out to folks. So if we have the eyes to read those things, we can see indigeneity uh, in a lot of different ways all around us, uh, which I think is an important phenomenon. Um, so Makanakong, uh, the turtle's back is where I am from. Literally, the great my great grandmother's from a, a village called uh, Makanakum, and that is the turtles back, and that goes back to our origin narratives about Gijigokwe and Sky Woman falling from the sky, and then remolding the land, um, coming to a to a, a water world, and then remolding the land on a turtle's back, uh, and that is an important phenomenon uh, within our within our narratives, and Dr. Freeland is how I'm called. So. Um, Thank you for the invite. I'm always happy to speak to different folks and I kind of work through. So uh, if you're interested in the work of what Tink Tinker has done, we have a Fetz Drift, uh, which will be coming out uh, as an honoring book. Uh, it's supposed to be out in December. It might be kind of pushed into that January, February, but we just kind of got the final draft and did the final edits on that about um, col colonialism and the gospel as a threat to American Indian communities. Uh, which is some pretty hard hitting stuff, but it is a reality in our community. So that is, that is where we're at right now. So I feel free if you all want to use the chat function. Uh, I am always happy to answer questions and negotiate that way. It's been kind of a, a way to use that uh, as we go through. Um, coming to you live from a workout room in my <laughs> the corner of my house, because uh, that's just kind of where we're at. Uh, as I was talking to Rob a minute ago, the, the numbers out here in COVID-wise are spiking up pretty high. So we're, we're limited uh, in movement um, on our own accord. We choose to stay hunkered down as much as possible. So I guess I, I should put some more art up here in a different way other than road cycling wheel bags, but such is where we're at right now. So um, <clears throat> do, I have, do I have screen share availabilities? Oh, you're, uh, if you can hook me up, Rob, there, you're muted, but I'm presuming you are 
trying to get me up and running. Yes, yes. Let me let me work on that right now. Sure thing. Um, so today, I, I would like to share. You know, so we kind of got Indigenous Indigenous Peoples Day yesterday slash Columbus Day. Um, I have a piece that I wrote uh, with Dr. Tink Tinker um, about 2007 ish. Uh, that was published in a peer review article about Caribbean demography and the realities of the Colombian legacy. So I was going to share a little bit of that with you. I always think it's really important to kind of understand the, the, the reality uh, behind what it is that we have regarding um, our narratives particularly. So We can get to that in just a second. So I do, I don't know a lot about you, Pike. If, um, I know it's a small liberal arts college, but so I, I did my undergrad at the University of Michigan and then did a few years in, the, uh, in working in residential treatment with youth. And then went to Alice School of Theology. I was in Denver for 13 years and did a Master of Divinity there with a PhD in religious and uh, theological studies. Um, I did all that actually to help to demonstrate that religious concepts don't translate into our languages. Um, so I did, uh, there's a lot of different ways we can negotiate uh, what those, where there's commonalities, we can talk about commonalities and where we have to separate culture out, uh, which is a particularly important phenomenon uh, when we, we're retranslating our own languages in that, in that process. So, um, but I do, I'm gonna be very honest about what this Colombian reality is. And so there is a few pieces that are visuals that are from Theodore de Vry, uh, who was a Dutch uh, wood carver who was uh, making carvings of firsthand eyewitness accounts of people coming back, particularly from the Caribbean, but also from North America as well. So those are going to be arranged. I just like to name that up front that they're um, very honest images about the brutality. Uh, I'm not going to dwell on that, but I, I think it's important if we're going to talk about the, what is it, this reality of a Colombian legacy, we have to kind of be realistic on that. One way or the other. Zoom always has that tab over top of my uh, the buttons here. All right. So. Here in South Dakota, we actually have Indigenous Peoples Day uh, instead of Columbus Day. And this is the first state that actually shifted. Um, so it kind of makes sense that South Dakota is about technically 10% Indigenous, uh, mostly Lakota, Dakota, Nakota peoples. Um, we know that number is horribly low um, because the census is notoriously bad of not counting because it requires people to actually participate. Uh, and there's a lot of non-participation. The, the reality is it's probably closer to 20% of the population is indigenous out here. Uh, and there are strengths and weaknesses about going this route of renaming it to something like Indigenous Peoples Day. Um, so th there's eight states, 10 universities, and 130 plus cities and counties no longer celebrate Columbus Day. Uh, and we would certainly applaud that, that there's this shift. Um, the the, the other downside of that is if it just kind of goes to Indigenous Peoples Days, it can also function to use denial to think about the realities of what Columbus has done um, and what that colonization has done. So while we certainly don't want to celebrate in that sense, uh, keeping that sort of memory in, in a realistic sense is also very important. Of course, that's where education comes in. Uh, we, want, we do want to develop that deeper understanding of the connections between Columbus and colonization and at the same time, identify indigenous realities here because K through 12 education particularly does a poor job. So in that sense, like if, if I use the term like ignorance, I don't, it's not a pejorative like judgment against somebody. There is just a gross lack of knowledge about indigenous people that is realistic in our culture right now. So that is where we uh, work to, to try to adjust that. So some of the basic uh, negotiations of Colombian realities. Um, this one's a little bit dated, though. If you know, if you're you know pushing 50 in my row uh, um, age group, when I was young, it was the narrative was that Columbus demonstrated that the world was round and the world was not flat. And of course, we know that that's not accurate. Um, there, the, the idea that the world was round is actually pretty old throughout this period in um, 
Europe and in other places. Um, of course, he's not the first European to the Americas. Uh, Scandinavian uh, Viking folks did that 500 years prior to that. Um, and decades before 1492, Basque fishing boats. The Basque region is kind of north, uh, western Iberian Peninsula, or what is now Spain. Um, their fishing fleets were fishing cod off the coast of what is now Nova Scotia and doing very well. Like the, the fisheries were very, very uh, useful. So they knew that there was land over there. We know that Columbus, um, I always hate using the term Columbus, his actual name is Cristobal Colon. Uh, the idea of Christopher Columbus is a sanitized, anglicized version uh, of this that comes out in the 1800s. And we know that he was a slave trader prior to 1492, uh, sailing to and from the west coast of Africa to slave markets, uh, mostly for Portuguese uh, folks. Of course, Portugal did not exist as a, as a state or as, as a nation, neither did Spain. They are feudal states at this point. Um, it was Castile and Aragon, which had recently united with the marriage of Ferdinand and Isabella. Uh, and of course, uh, Cologne or Columbus never set foot in North America. Um, so this first voyage, just some of the blunt realities. He was lost, thought he was in India. Uh, he was a terrible captain and navigator. So some of the, the sanitized version now is like, oh, he was a great navigator. It's like, no, he crashed and sunk the Santa Maria on his first voyage. He went there with three ships and he came back with two because he ran it against the wishes of his own men. And he wrote about this in his own diary, right? Um, and he had to leave behind five crew members in the Caribbean, which, you know, worst places to be left behind. But there's, um, there's it certainly was not a good uh, captain in any way, shape, or sailor in any way, shape, or form. He was the first transatlantic slave trader. He kidnapped 15 Taino people and took them to Seville to be sold in the slave markets and, on this first voyage. Uh, and he grossly overemphasized and lied about the possibility of gold mining, uh, what was going to be there about this negotiation. Um, so the papal bull entered Caeteras for May 1493. This comes into play and just going to kind of touch base. That Pope Alexander VI, of course, at this point, they didn't, there was no evidence in that area that this huge landmass was there. So once it was found, this was actually a crisis in theological and legal thought. Uh, what do we do about this huge land base? Uh, so Pope Alexander VI uh, grants all lands west and south of the Azores and Cape Verde Islands to uh, Ferdinand and Isabella, and then south of that uh, um, was for the Portuguese king. Um, and this bull gives primacy of colonization to Ferdinand and Isabella uh, for most of the Americas. And this becomes some of the conflict and why the legal tradition uh, works out the way that it does. This, he goes back October of 1493, um, and this was not a voyage, this was not exploration, this was a full out military endeavor. Um, this was a military assault. He, he sailed 17 ships with more than a thousand men, had a unit of cavalry lancers with horses and dogs of war. And so, so I'm going to share some of this bit here. So Theodore de Bry is a, like I said, a Dutch carver, painter, and communicator. So the ways in which much of this information gets translated to communities, because in around 1500, almost nobody was literate, right? And this is kind of the cool thing if we think about architecture and art, right? It was a means of communication to the masses of people, right? So that's this, um, we think about um, the um, stained glass, like in churches, right? Th this is an art form used to communicate in pictures to people, to what's going on, it's this beautiful art form, right? Uh, and architecture and how these things all communicate some very specific information uh, to masses of people who are not literate at this time. And so this is the kind of the negotiation that the Bray is in, and he's taking these first-hand accounts which were written and giving them pictorial form. And it's usually not some sort of accurate depiction of what one thing, one thing is, it's kind of a conglomerate and we'll talk a little bit more about that. So there's multiple images kind of in one thing kind of condensed to tell a story. Uh, and that is kind of what the, the medium was attempting to do at that time. Uh, so this is Castilian cavalry. This is what a lancer would be. Um, so horse mounted, very long spear. Um, 
So dogs of war. Um, so giant dogs were bred for the purpose of participating in warfare in Europe at this time. Sometimes they wore armor such as this. Other times it was more specific. So we're not talking about a lab. We're talking like an Irish wolfhound type size, right? So this is these giant, huge, huge animals, you know, 150 upwards of 200 pound dogs, very fast and bred to be vicious. There's another kind of example. So some more kind of leatherized uh, armor. So they can, they can be, a big dog can certainly disrupt what a horse is doing, right? So in, in the European negotiation, um, but they were used for warfare. Um, so it was another example here. So this is one of Debray's paintings. Um, this is a wood carving. And so this is of course the, the Spanish or the Castilians in the background kind of having a, a fun form of, of entertainment uh, in which the dogs are feeding and uh, viciously attacking people. <clears throat> uh, this is another one. So during the period of uh, Columbia rule, so 1493 to 1500, they had to fill a hawk's bell, this little bell full of gold, and that was their quota for a certain period of time. And they couldn't do that. They, were, they would chop off their hands and leave just the, the string from the skin hanging. And they were said, say, go show them these letters. And this is a punishment. So they didn't go back and show the people what the punishment was for not filling their quota of gold. Um, this is um, a narrative. Uh, this is actually very important for indigenous people, uh, particularly in the Caribbean. So this is Hatue. Uh, and Hatue, um, his negotiation of this, he's actually in Cuba, not in what has become Española, uh, and now, of course, is the Dominican Republic in Haiti. Uh, the narrative of Hatue is that he was a cacique, or as a leader in what is now Cuba. Uh, and he was in the conquest in that area um, of course, they, they captured the caciques, and um, he was going to be baptized before he was killed so he could go to heaven, and they're trying to communicate through this broken translation. Um, and so this would have been early 1500s, so 1505, 1508, somewhere in there. And um, so Hathaway, uh, in this broken translation, the, the, the narrative that we have is that he is asking them, it's like, well, who, who goes to heaven? What is this heaven? It's like, well, you get the right hand of God, you know, and Hathaway comes back and said, well, where do you go? And they were like, well, we go, we go to heaven. Anyone who's baptized goes to heaven. He's like, then don't baptize me. I choose to go to hell because I don't want to be around any of you. So there are these narratives of resistance early on. So it's important to kind of keep that narrative of resistance up. It started at the moment of conquest, like, and the same thing with you know, African slavery, right? Resistance started in the West Coast of Africa to it, not, you know, later on in the civil rights movement. Um, so this one is, um, they were said that the, the narratives come, these narratives we get from largely from Bartolome de la Casas, who uh, becomes a Dominican friar at this time. He was originally a conquistadores uh, and had a land grant of an encomienda, uh, which is you're granted, the, the Spanish were granted land and the Indians who lived on it so as their slaves. That was the grant from uh, the king and the pope at this time. Uh, so that they were sometimes for punishment, they were hung 13 at a time uh, in honor of uh, Jesus and his 12 disciples. Um, and of course, there we see the Smashies taking these children and they're just violently uh, cracking the heads of, of the children against houses, rocks, whatever, just to get rid of them. And of course, then they're feeding the children to the dogs. Uh, and this is all written in Las Casas and other firsthand comment accounts um, about what the reality of Spanish conquest was. Uh, so what we know the reality here. So these are just kind of best evidence from historical realities. That is the population of Española uh, plummeted from approximately 8 million to 500,000. And that is between 1493 and 1500 when Columbus was the governor. So we know that through dem demographic evidence, um, they, in 1496, they did a, an accounting, the uh, Departamento, uh, which is a, an actual census. And there is one point three million uh, indigenous peoples then, but that was only people age 14 to about 50 who, are, who could work. 
Uh, so that, that didn't count the kids, it didn't count the elders, um, and didn't, that was only half the island. So using uh, algorithms to extrapolate that out, it comes to about 8 million. Um, so 7.5 million dead um, in that time period. We know that Columbus led the pacification of the island of Taino peoples, uh, and they, what they were resisting is violence. And this instituted a cycle of violence perpetuating genocide. So one of the apologies that is often given is that, well, it was germ warfare, you know, it was just germs that did it, you know, it was the swine flu that went in. We know there was probably a swine flu that comes through in this 1494 to 1496. Um, but that, that only tells part of the narrative. Like if, if someone comes in, I mean, we're in dealing with a pandemic right now, right? So we all have responsibilities. You know, if you're a carrier, they knew they were carriers. Like they knew what, they knew what germ warfare was and used it actually. So um, that while most of the killing took place probably from the, the swine flu and other smallpox and such, that can't be an apologetic because if you know what's going on and if you're a decent person you're going to come back at the beach and be like okay we're not going to contact you anymore like you go ahead and get better and then we'll stay back here but it's the cycle of violence so the 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 warring uh the warfare the outright killing and the cultural dislocation uh in that resistance and keeping people away from their usual food sources they can't plant uh they can't have their medicines um, and it is that cycle of violence. So the, the disease, cultural dislocation and outright violence, that is the cycle of genocide. And of course, in 1500, he was removed from the governorship in chains and sent back to Castile uh, and put on trial for mismanagement. He wasn't put on trial for killing anyone. He was put on trial for mismanaging meaning the government. Um, we know he did take another uh, voyage uh, in that one had similar results in other places, though he never attained the sort of status that he had in this 1494 to 1500. Um, again, feel free to ask questions if you have any. I'm always happy to converse with folks. I know that some of this is difficult information, um, but it's important that we look it in the face, and that's just the reality. Um, if we're going to be decent people with one another, which I believe we can, um, we do have to kind of face these things and what better situation to do that kind of in a educational set setting, right? So <clears throat> this narrative of Columbus really isn't like Columbus wasn't really a person in, in what we now know as America until in around 18, mid 1800s. And then this narrative, this hero narrative gets created. So we get Samuel Morrison, uh, the Voyager Navigator of the Open Seas, Admiral of the Open Seas, I think uh, is the name of that one. And then this kind of culminates in 1893 uh, World Fair in Chicago in which this icon gets elevated to hero status. Uh, and then all this kind of narrative gets created much of what's written about him is a hagiography or just kind of a gross aggrandizement of what he was and everybody didn't um like you know he's a great sailor well you don't you don't crash your your main ship as a great sailor you know you're you're, you're a decent person you're going to um you're not going to kill this many people even more damaging though is kind of the systemic underlying piece this narrative becomes the basis of legal traditions. So the idea of discovery kind of gets legalized in the form of doctrine of discovery. So this becomes the, the base narrative that people learn, which then sanitizes the, the taking or the theft of land. Uh, and this quote is uh, from Johnson v. McIntosh, this is Chief Justice John Marshall in 1823. On the discovery of this immense continent, the great nations of Europe were eager to appropriate themselves so much of it they could respectively acquire. Its vast extent offered an ample field to the ambition and enterprise of all, and the character and religion of its inhabitants afforded an apology for considering them as people over whom the superior genius of Europe might claim an ascendancy. The potentates of this old world found no difficulty in convincing themselves that they made up ample compensation to the American Indians for bestowing on them civilization and Christianity. So these become the apologetics. Because we civilized and brought Christianity, we can take your land. 
uh, and there are other crystallized forms of this justifying land theft. This becomes kind of the, this doctrine of discovery which gets negotiated. Furthermore, um, these multiple narratives get created. So if we're going to talk, and this is where I always love being in the room because we can, you know, have a, a little greater interaction, but if we're asking, you know, what do people know about Indigenous people, usually it's the kind of stereotype of actually where I'm at, uh, buffalo hunters living in teepees. That's primarily what is understood, right? The, the reality of what people lived in different areas is usually not very well understood. But these narratives get created uh, and colonization is justified through these binaries of civilization versus the wild, agriculture versus hunter-gatherer, and the cities as a static place consistent across time versus nomadic people. Um, the issue is, is they're all projected lies. Like they're not accurate depictions of indigenous people, uh, what we're doing here at any point in time, right? So the idea that the bigger one is about this agriculture versus hunter-gatherer, that we didn't, that we weren't agriculturalists, like, but if we recall the Thanksgiving story, we had there's corn involved, right? And just as, just as a thought exercise, try to imagine just for a second, contemporary farming without corn. You think about the, the gigantic contributions agriculturally from indigenous people. Um, these are things were talked about over and over again. And actually John Locke is the one who wrote uh, that agricultural societies have a greater right to the soil than nomadic hunter-gatherers. But of course, nomadic hunter-gatherers is not who we were. We're like, we had these giant cities. Um, so I would actually like to move to that. So we're still following Debray here, right? So he's got this huge corpus of, of negotiations. So if we look at, this is a village of Secotan uh, in what is now Virginia. So in and around this uh, James um, Chesapeake Bay, essentially, right? There are giant villages all over the place. So villages of three to 5,000 are common you know, 10 to 15,000 are also quite common, not quite as much, but you're figuring the mouth of the river trading areas. And they were all up and down these river areas. So they think about this estuary of what is Chesapeake Bay, it was a gigantic food belt. Um, so this is uh, the prize painting from, again, firsthand knowledge, uh, firsthand people who are writing about it. Of course, upper right hand corner, we see large cornfields, uh, other planted fields, crops, sunflowers in the left hand side here. And each one of these houses um, actually houses several hundred people. Uh, so these are long houses. And I mean, they're kind of condensed in, right? But we know what sort of living arrangements people had and did. You know, there's both from indigenous knowledge as well as from archaeological knowledge. Um, a certain rich, agricultural system. So up in the upper left, you see there's somebody hunting deer back there. Um, it's very much almost cut off, but it's there. You know, we did a lot of controlled burns, which then keeps meadows open and then blueberries growing and small shoots of grasses, which then keeps deer and rabbit and elk and all sorts of other stuff around. And in those senses, we're surrounded by our own kind of nature preserves. Um, and then hunting is actually rather easy. You know, these are not difficult negotiations. Um, you know, I like to, to, you know, I'm from the Great Lakes area, right? And the, the, the ways in which the lakes were teeming and the rivers with fish, you know, this wasn't us, you know, sitting with a spear or waiting for hours for a fish to come by, right? Everybody's got their own fish trap. <laughs> and when you were hungry, you went to your fish trap and you just pulled out fish and you're good to go, right? This is not some sort of difficult thing. We had all types of technologies in which the idea of survival is ridiculous. We actually, it was very, very easy to get food and we had all these gardens, you know, and different sources of agriculture depending on what latitude you lived largely. Uh, this is the Virginia area. Um, 
another of the Bry painting, uh, hunting geese and such in the background. Um, another village in Florida. Uh, again, each one of these would be a multifamily household. Um, this one uh, is surrounded by palisades. Um, lots of different reasons. This is not because of warfare. Um, usually the palisades are more about like wind. Uh, they're more about like keeping other potential animals out. You know, if you think about Florida, alligators are gigantic and can kind of come through and do what they want. Um, if you have a palisade, you can, you know, limit those sort of contacts. Actual warfare between indigenous people was pretty uncommon. Um, and while it did happen occasionally in flurries, um, it was largely non-lethal. Uh, a lot of posturing, um, often if somebody got killed is then the battle would be called off. And people, you know, while we have bow and arrow and spears and everything, you would go into battle with a stick about yay big. Um, it's a very different understanding of how that those things happen. And over our, by and large, um, those are pretty rare. Um, some bean planting here, uh, another Florida picture, um, pretty large field, what we can see. Uh, and this would be the village of Hochelaga, uh, the original Mohawk village, but is now Montreal. And even at that latitude up in the St. Lawrence area, now we know this is also kind of a maritime climate uh, because of the Great Lakes, holds so much heat from the summer that it, it, it holds it, where I'm at in South Dakota, it's way colder uh, than the Great Lakes because the lakes hold uh, a whole lot of heat. Uh, and rarely actually do the lakes freeze over. That's pretty uncommon actually. Uh, but the upper left hand corner, of course, we see a lot more cornfields. Uh, we see tons of corn. Uh, and this is a picture actually of uh, Cartier's uh, first landing and treating with uh, indigenous folks who are now the Mohawk. Um, so this is just the kind of name that like primary documents all demonstrate huge agricultural production um, and people meeting and treating with people and a very peaceful negotiation, right? This is not some sort of hostile wilderness. We got huge villages uh, all up and down uh, the situation. So this is all available in primary documents. So it, you can't, you don't just have to take indigenous people's word for it, true, you know, but this corroborates what it is we've been saying for a long time, uh, that these things are particularly important. Uh, and it flies in the face of particularly the legal justification of taking of land and um, how that all played out. So there's a lot of different ways and it's very complex throughout time about which, whether it's Iberian justifications in the Caribbean and then what is Mexico and South America and then what becomes British and French justifications, they're all a little bit different. Uh, and then how that translates to American uh, jurisprudence, particularly post 1786. Um, the commonality though is that it was going to be taken over was a done deal. Um, that we could actually live together was never really considered. Um, so those are all some very challenging things to negotiate. So I, I think in this idea of Columbia legacy, I always like to communicate to people like, this isn't just this person who went there, right? It wasn't just an event. We have this negotiation across time about how these narratives play out. And it is the narratives themselves that I think do as much damage as anything else that we have to undermine those, those narratives to give some very specific um, understandings. Um, so I, I do have a couple more things. I always like to stop there before I kind of pivot. Does anyone have any questions or talking points that you wanna have, I'm always happy to converse with folks. Dr. Freeland, I have a question. Please. Um, and forgive me if this jumps ahead, but it struck mm -hmm. me on one of your first slides when you talked about the strengths and weaknesses of Indigenous Peoples Day. Mm -hmm. If you could sort of apply the same strength and weaknesses to the question of universities, or even individual faculty members in their syllabi indicating, you know, honoring the land mm -hmm. on which the mm -hmm. institution sits. And if you could take into consideration the strengths and weaknesses, what might a statement like that sound like? 
that mm. would do more good than harm? Yeah, um, you know, that's a great question, you know, and that is in part where I'm kind of heading a minute, so I, I appreciate the question. By and large, as long as you're adding to the knowledge, which I do think land acknowledgements are a good way of doing that as long as they're written well, um, do far more good than any difficulty. The only difficulty is if they're poorly written, which then kind of sanitizes the narrative. And really, these are these are the trans these are this is why translations and this is what gets me out of bed in the morning to do my own research right so i'm fascinated with translations and actually how we think about things what words actually mean what are the socio-political realities on the ground which are the experiential understanding of those words so land acknowledgement is so loaded right we have to piece that apart and think through right property is not something we have a conceptualization of not as far as ownership that's a very foreign concept, right? And I, I think a lot of people get squeamish around land acknowledgements, like there's some sort of giving back. Um, and while reparations are a nice idea, in and of itself, that's not necessarily what is being sought after. I think universities have a lot of responsibility uh, to do this sort of thing, just to acknowledge that this is the landscape that was originally, uh, the inhabitants are these people, this is what they're about. So I think, that there is a, a kind of a two-part thing with the ones that are doing well. We've actually just kind of revamped our own, um, which is kind of a simple statement, which can be then put into syllabi uh, just as a recognition, which I think are very positive things. And they're usually something to the effect of, you know, South Dakota State University sits on the land originally occupied by the Chetty Shakowi, uh, the Lakota, Dakota, Nakota peoples. Specific of this land um, was Dakota land, and uh, we acknowledge that those are the people and ancestors and inhabitants originally of this area. Then we have some longer negotiations of that that we're developing just to say this is a treaty process. And for this process is really important because we have, um, we're a land grant university, right? So we, the monies that originally started the university were made from stolen Lakota land, right? So we, we know where those plots of land are. And we actually get an ongoing lease uh, of a tune of about a half a million a year from Lakota land. And that's actually BLM land, but that's being leased out, right? Um, so President Barry Dunn, when he came on four or five years ago, repurposed those funds to support indigenous people, uh, students recruitment and retention, that's the Wokeney Initiative. Um, so those are some really cool things that we're doing that we are repurposing and connecting the land specifically to supporting indigenous students. So there are some really interesting things that you can do and, and it depends on where you're at and what, how your source streams, your revenue streams function, right? Um, and whatever makes sense. Um, you know, as, as a, a side note, like in the United Methodist Church, I always try to push them. So we, there's, a, there's a special Sunday uh, Native American Giving Day, it's like in May or something like that. And it's a beautiful thing because it's voluntary and people would just be like, hey, I think that's a cool idea. We're gonna help, you know, indigenous students go to school and, you know, get master's degrees. Um, and that's a very beautiful thing. And then a lot of indigenous people were pretty squeamish about actually being very honest with me, like this is reparations. Like this is a very good example of people voluntary, like you're not, forcing anyone to do it. Like it's a voluntary special offering. Like, and I think that's a really cool thing, but you know, I kind of got shot down to talk about it as reparations. Um, and then the next year they no longer gave me that scholarship, by the way, um, associated with it. There's a lot of background, but that's a whole nother conversation. Um, there's a lot Thank of, you. no problem. There's, um, there's some really cool things that you can do there, I think. And I think if you're being very honest in negotiating those pieces, I think it's, um, that one is certainly some of the lower hanging fruit, you know, honestly. Thank you very much. You bet. Other questions? All right. Um, so we got a couple more minutes, I think. And, um, so I'll skip way ahead, uh, and I always like to talk about the contemporary uh, as much as possible. These historical realities are, are important to unearth. 
uh, I think, and to kind of think about, but one of the glaring problems that we have is that in the psyche of Americana, we as indigenous people just like don't exist in the present tense. And that is this creation of chronological distance uh, in which when you create narratives about people and keep them in this past, it's about Indian wars, it's about this conquest. Um, if that's all people know, it's hard to think through what that looks like in the present tense. So I'll share a little bit about my own community and try to give a complex negotiation of a few things. Uh, so there's a lot of stereotypes around casinos and such. Uh, I will name up front, I'm not a huge fan of casinos. I think there's as many problems as uh, solutions associated with them. I don't think they've been theorized nearly enough. Um, however, the data demonstrates very specifically that in some cases, some very good things have come out of it. And I'll share some of that. And this is not some sort of tacit, like, I'm not a proponent necessarily, um, but if we can look realistically what the data and the evidence shows, you know, it depends on how you negotiate those sort of financial distributions. So, um, uh, again, I'm from Bahutang, the, the, the federally recognized name is uh, Sioux St. Marie Tribe of Chippewa Indians, uh, which someone who's a nerd on translations, it's a little bit weird that we have French words like Sioux St. Marie and Chippewa uh, in our federally recognized name, which doesn't make a whole lot of sense to us. Uh, so I always say that I'm Bahutang. So, We, um, I don't want to start this. So real quick, this jump from kind of sanitization, taking of land treaties is, is a long kind of narrative. One of the big things that we do have to name is the treatment of boarding schools uh, and the stealing of our children uh, between 1893 and 1934. About half of our children were taken and brutalized in these work camps essentially. And of the half that were taken, about one third died in custody of curable diseases and malnutrition. So th th this is this kind of brutality. As the sanitized narratives are being created, they're being created in the academy in anthropology. Uh, people just, you know, woe is us. You know, these people are disappearing. Well, yeah, we're disappearing because you keep stealing our children and killing them. Um, that's kind of the issue. So we get through that and then this empowerment uh, movement kind of post 1960s there's a lot of engagement at a local level to kind of take it take control and to get some agency back uh, in my community uh, we did uh, negotiate uh, to get some casino properties uh, and this comes back to a supreme court case in the 1980s that allowed it out of california um, which is you know you look at the, what the actual case was about is it a bingo parlor in California and now we've got these huge casinos it's a little bit weird but um, so our community was the, the one who got a, a, a casino in Detroit um, so obviously with a much larger population you're going to make some more money and so we were doing pretty good for a while uh, until the tribal chairman came out when he was going to be reelected uh, his compensation package was 800,000 a year in the early 1990s um, and you know when there's a lot of employment for for us in the local community which was great but there's a pretty big difference between you know making eight nine ten dollars an hour uh and having health care and eight hundred thousand dollar salary which is a gross out of balance so he did not get reelected. um but we've taken these properties so there's a couple of different ways of thinking about them um a small number of groups do full up per, per capita payments, it's called, and that is that if you are a tribal citizen, sometimes it's degraded or there's like a hierarchy of blood quantum that is used, which is some of the more negative versions, uh, and people just get full up payments of this. And um, the only about 10% of communities actually do that. In my, in my community, we voted on it and uh, we actually do a community based. Um, negotiation, so it all goes into larger funds. Uh, we employ well over 2,000 tribal members. Um, I mean, notwithstanding COVID, I'm sure a lot of people are out of work right now. If it's based on casino money, the people aren't traveling in the same way. Um, but with those community-based monies, uh, we're able to build our own school. So we have the J.K.L. Bahutang School, 
Uh, so you use the charter school system. Again, I'm not a huge fan of charter schools because I think they, the, the evidence demonstrates that they're not great uh, for people more often than not. Um, but ours, it allows us freedom to use our own curriculum so we're able to teach language and some of our own pieces uh, and we're able to use that pretty well. Uh, we also have, uh, we're able to build three, I think four large um, healthcare facilities in a, in a outsource area. So we're in a rural area in Northern Michigan. So in St. Marie, we took over the hospital and then in, in these out satellite communities, we're building healthcare facilities in each one of those. So what that means is my grandmother, when she was alive, didn't have to travel three and a half hours to Sault Ste. Marie to get healthcare. Uh, she could go 15 minutes up the road to the healthcare facility there. And they also function as community centers and quite a bit of money um, was given back to local communities to do stuff like rebuild rec centers, go figure Northern Michigan hockey is a pretty big deal. So there's quite a few hockey rinks uh, negotiated there to negotiate, to get those things, people moving, healthcare initiatives, stuff like that. So that being said, you know, if people are focused on kind of creating our own systems of what's important in healthcare and education, you know, there's some pretty positive uh, involvement there. Um, tribal politics aside, uh, there are, you know, some difficulties in fighting associated with it. You know, when you go from having a, a trust front from the government because of treaties to uh, a revenue stream of 400 million, um, there can be some difficulties with that. Uh, and that's some of the challenges that we've had. Um, so the other thing that has helped allowed us to do is to renegotiate and actually have good DC lawyers uh, renegotiate an 1836 treaty. Uh, so this is a treaty of Washington 1836 in which then holds on to our hunting and fishing rights. So when I go back home to Michigan to hunt and to gather and to fish, I don't have to go to the state of Michigan. I go to my home community to get my licenses for that. And that is according to this treaty. So this is one of the reasons why we hold on to these treaties, why it's really important to hold them up as government to government relationships, nation to nation relationships, is that we're really good at it. Um, I, some of my research goes into um, retranslating our language actually away from religious language into scientific language because some of it functions way better that way. Uh, they're far more accurate translations um, to be to be blunt. So um, that is where we're you know shifting and heading kind of in that academic sense. And um, while things are far from great, um, what we've seen kind of in the shift of agency, taking control of our own schools, taking control of these treaty um, negotiations, helping to manage our own landscapes and environments um, has been a boon, not just for us, but also in those relationships with people around us. Um, you know, we see the, 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 the wildfires. One of the problems with wildfires is, you know, we can have the, the debate about global warming but the reality is there's a ton of fuel on the ground and if we know how to deal with that, like fire as a technology is very good. And if you can embrace fire as a, as a positive technology um, and find ways to do it well, like you can limit those sort of destructive fires. And we've been doing that for millennia um, really well. Uh, that there's ways in which to negotiate those that are a whole lot better. Um, <clears throat> so, that is to say, you know, what, what I really work on is helping to communicate those things about, hey, we can work together um, on these sort of pro processes on these technologies as we work. Um, I'm working on um, a, a grant towards an NSF grant uh, with folks in natural resource management here that is about fire technology and uh, regenerative agriculture because um, we're, we're really good at it. We know how to do that and to combine some of those technologies and write about it and collect data um, is a very useful phenomenon. Uh, so that's what we try to do uh, here uh, with the students that were coming through. So then we have monies to support them and to pay them uh, for their labor and working through some of these grants with them. So, um, you know, I think, while I'm always happy to talk pretty much until my voice goes hoarse, um, I, I really appreciate everyone's you know, opportunity to listen in. I hope you all can get some mileage out of this. I'm always happy to converse further if folks, um, you know, want to, you're gonna show in class and there's questions that come up, I'm always happy to converse on stuff like that too. 
and that building relationships between institutions is always good. So um, I'm always happy. If there's any other questions right now, I'm happy to converse as well. You've given us a lot to think about. I really appreciate your time today. I just had one question about resources. So mm -hmm. if leaving this talk today and you've given us so much to think about, but if we were at the beginning and just said, you know, all this is kind of new for me and I'm just trying to think about this, a general resource, maybe a book or a talk that may be beneficial, what, what would be step one would you recommend? Mm, that's a great question. Um, is there a particular direction you want to go? I'm thinking about if I, if I were an undergraduate student, I'm 18 or 19, and I just kind of grew up in a home where, you know, Christopher Columbus, go team, everything's great. We hear that narrative. Mm -hmm. um, but now I realize, wow, some really bad stuff happened and still kind of goes on today. Um, what would be a good resource just to begin to think about that? Um, well, that's a great question. Um, so I will give a a couple of different ones because I do think there are different ways of negotiating this. So pedagogically, uh, both my wife and I are big fans of uh, novels um, because the ways in which novels can negotiate. We teach a course in here called AIS 211, which is uh, South Dakota American Indians in Education. And we found pretty quickly that by creating, by using a novel, we help people to care. Uh, and too much data has a, a form of dehumanizing if we, if we only focus on that. But the combination of kind of evidence data, your scientific writing, uh, and at the same time, you know, those narratives. So I'm a big fan of Louise Erdrich, and there's several other really good authors, but Louise Erdrich, um, she has a whole host of novels. I do think if we're talking about contemporary, The Roundhouse is pretty hard hitting in which she, this is about um, sexual violence on indigenous communities and the, the legal difficulties and structures associated with that because we literally cannot prosecute anybody that isn't from our own reservation so people can come on there and commit violent acts and then are rarely prosecuted. Um, the, her, her latest one is uh, The Night Watchman and that's about termination uh, so in the 1950s, the U.S. government was trying to go through and just to literally terminate relationships and say, you're no longer Indian, we don't have to deal with treaties. Um, so that is about that piece. Um, her Love Medicine is kind of a classic. That was her first novel, and it was just kind of gives a reality of lived Indigenous experience. That's kind of this complex identity stuff. Um, Leslie Silco is also a really good author, and she, um, so Ceremony is one of her classic texts, uh, Almanac of the Dead. And a new uh, author, um, Tommy Orange's book, There, There, is a little more, it's about urban Indian experience. And it's a little more advanced, that, like it, it helps to have some background knowledge, but that's also a very good uh, version. I think if we're talking about kind of your, and like a better term, kind of your textbook stuff, anything from Vine Deloria Jr., you know, particularly some of his early stuff around um, Red Earth, White Lies, around God is Red, um, helps to give some worldview differences. Um, and that is certainly a, a really good piece. If anyone has likes legal language, uh, Robert Williams Jr. Is a, is a big person to kind of follow, which would be great. And he wrote the American Indian and Western Legal Thought, um, which is a pretty long read, but it follows this legal thought trajectory from essentially the Crusades into uh, American legal jurisprudence and how those that language gets developed to take and, to, and, and for conquest. Uh, but he also follows um, the Linking Arms Together uh, is also a very good book. And he talks about the role of early indigenous treaties and the agency of indigenous people in that early period, you know, kind of 1600 to 1800, which is a great read, I think, for, er for early on, uh, because it helps to demonstrate agency, because usually historical material is kind of like, it's about conquest, and it's about colonization, it's not about what is, what's the agency and how do ind indigenous people work those systems as well.
Well, those are some really uh, good resources. I think, especially those novels, that'll be helpful. Kind of yeah. what I was thinking about for for students. Um, mm -hmm. Well, I really, really appreciate your time. I know it's always a busy time as an academic. So uh, on behalf of the University of Pikeville, we thank you. Um, mm -hmm. and you've given us a lot to think about. So if any further questions come up, we will we'll send them out your way. We, we greatly appreciate your time. Um, excellent. Well, I, I, it's always an honor to kind of speak for, with you all and to make new acquaintances. So if there's anything else, we, you know, I can answer questions or whatnot, I'm always happy to do that. And you all have a good day. and. Maybe we'll see you again in the future. Okay, thank you. See ya. Yeah, bye. bye.